shall we get, get the show on the road? All right. So good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming out tonight on this nice spring, uh, early spring evening, although it is a little chilly, very chilly. Uh, we've been anticipating some warmer weather for some of our friends to arrive, some of the ones that we're going to talk about tonight. I know Becca was out today to see if she could bring some in for uh, people to look at as we talk about the different species in New Hampshire, and she didn't find anything. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, But that's what happens. Insects are temperature dependent, so they vary with the seasons, and, and that often affects how many there are out there over the course of multiple years. Uh, we did bring some uh, eggs and pupa or chrysalis from our captive rearing lab. So after the talk tonight, uh, we can take a look at some of the species. Uh, we do have the corner blue butterfly and the frosted elfin that we rear in our lab. And uh, actually, today was a really exciting day. It was. <laughs> Becca? Um, we took our eggs out of our captive rearing chamber and we had um, fresh larval hatch for the season. So our season kicked off this morning. So. Yeah. So earlier when we were looking in there, you could actually see the caterpillars starting to eat their way out of the egg. So it may be on a leaf by the time we're done talking. Um, so my name is Heidi Homan. I'm the lead biologist for the Carner Blue Butterfly Recovery. Also some of the other uh, rare threatened and endangered species. I'm starting new projects with help from people like Becca, uh, the White Mountain Fritillary, and also uh, monarchs. I'm representing the Northeast states uh, for the national conservation effort. And I work at the Captive Rearing Lab on the Carter Blue Butterfly Project. Um, so I'm in charge of all the captive rearing and getting the field season and the crew out and doing all of our surveys and stuff for, the pro for both the Carter and starting the Frosted Elfin Project. Super cool. So, um, as we progress, I wanted to start with the general view of butterflies in New Hampshire. And so there are over 130 species of butterflies in New Hampshire. And this came from work that New Hampshire Audubon did back in 2013 to compile reports from people who are surveying other personal amateur experts that go out. There are some people that have been monitoring butterflies in New Hampshire for 30 years, just going to the same places every year. But we actually don't have any formal way that we've captured their data before. So this was really a, a fantastic effort that Audubon did and that we'd like to build on. Uh, if, should we turn out the light to see better? Better? So here's just a, a snapshot of some of the variety of butterflies that we do have. They can be your typical cabbage butterflies that are going to be in your garden. They can range from uh, white. Uh, that's an orange sulfur that looks like the cabbage butterflies, similar family, uh, to skippers, which are very small and uh, almost look like crickets sometimes. Uh, larger butterflies that really catch people's eye early on, the morning cloak and the eastern tiger swallowtail. And some of our species look so similar, like the two in the top left corner, those are the azures. We have a spring azure and a summer azure. And really the only way you can tell them apart is the timing. Or if you look up close, you can see there's just that slight variation in color and a lot of times people don't take the time to notice that so I heard someone in the room say the name so they take the time to notice that so butterflies are an amazing taxonomic group and they are wonderful indicators of biodiversity which is one of the primary goals of the Fish and Game Division, we are the non-game and endangered species division, and it is our role to keep common species common and to protect and restore threatened and endangered species. 
As a taxa, they have very short lives, and so they're responsive to disturbances often caused by humans in many cases, or potentially climate change, which is a longer term uh, disturbance and threat. Uh, they rely on small patches of habitat, and so again, that makes them very responsive to change, and so it's easy to detect if there's a problem going on or a threat. Uh, they use every inch of New Hampshire. They, as an entire group of species, use wetlands, they use fields, they use woodlands, they use every plant, and so that also makes them a really, really good indicator of changes that are occurring. They're a barometer for what's going on. And also, we have just under 500 species of wildlife that are not fished or hunt in the state of New Hampshire. So 130 of them are butterflies. So they're a really large group of what we track of wildlife. So back to biology 101 of butterflies. And here is a typical life cycle you probably learned very early on in school. A lot of times people study the monarch. That's the primary uh, focus. This is the Carner blue butterfly. So you can see at the top you have the egg stage. Then it goes into the caterpillar, or what we call the larva. So it hatches out. and. During that caterpillar phase, it's feeding on a host plant. So that's all it does. It eats and eats and eats. And the time frame that it is a caterpillar varies between all species. It could depend on the quality of the plant. If it has very poor nutrition, it could potentially take over two years for a larva to develop and reach the pupal phase. Or if it's eating a nitrogen-rich plant, it could potentially develop into a larva within four to six weeks, very quickly. Also, the time that it's developing as a larva, if it's very warm where it is, that's going to speed up that development process. And more than likely, it's evolved to do that very quickly to make it before it gets cold. But we'll talk more about some of those variations when we look at specific species. Once it goes through the larval stage, then it goes into the chrysalis stage, or what we also refer to as the pupa. And so that's when the caterpillar stops moving and it starts to form this hard coating around it and it does the metamorphosis inside. And so this pupal stage, just like the larval stage, could have any variety of time frames. It could occur over the winter, or it could occur briefly for about seven days. It can be very quick. It just depends on the species. Once it hatches from the chrysalis, which we call eclosing, then it is the adult butterfly. The adult butterfly is going to fly around, mate, have nectar. How much nectar depends on the species, how much they need to survive. They can live three days to a month out in the wild, and sometimes that's related to the size of the butterfly. Sometimes it's related to, did it rain? They could eclose, and there could be a massive storm event, and that butterfly may not make it for the next day. So there's a lot of variation. Uh, one thing that is very interesting, again, is that they have these four basic phases, but there's so much variation about how they go about what they do. And so beyond the duration of each phase, the number of plants that each caterpillar eats, or each species of butterfly, greatly affects that life history, and also potentially how ubiquitous it is across the state and how many of them there are. So the availability of that plant in the larval stage is a big factor as to how many butterflies of that species you see. The number of generations per year. So some butterflies may only go through this cycle once. They may only have one flight, and then they're done. You'll see them for the month of April, and you won't see them again till next year. Some species will go through this cycle repeatedly, 
and they may be able to complete it three or four times in a year. Probably they're eating a really nutrient-rich plant that doesn't change much, so maybe it's a grass instead of a perennial. It doesn't change in its nutrient content over the year, and so it can complete those life cycles over and over and over again. The other thing is, do they overwinter here? Because <coughs> in temperate climates, butterflies just don't, they're not active in the winter. If we were a little bit further south, maybe they would be, but they either have to overwinter or they have to migrate. And they can overwinter in any one of these stages. There are examples of every type here in New Hampshire. So those are the things that really drive um, the butterfly populations in New Hampshire. So this is an example of one particular species of butterfly. This would be a early spring, summer flying butterfly. And so we laid out all of the life stages of the butterfly above the calendar months. And then down below is all the life stages of the host plant. So you can see this particular butterfly is an egg for its overwintering strategy. So the majority of its life, it's an egg. If it were a butterfly that overwintered as a caterpillar, it would have predominantly caterpillars most of the calendar year. So this is, sometimes people think about the life cycle of the butterfly only as the adult. But really, it's all year long in all of the stages. So then, this butterfly has two generations of larvae, and so they're able to complete that in a four-month time period, which lines up pretty closely to, this is the plant phase of its host plant. So it lines up very closely. This is the seed of its host plant. Uh, and then this is the flowering phase of the host plant. And so when you're thinking about a larva that's eating a host plant, that's going through growing, then it's growing its flowers, so it's got all of these nutrients to reproduce and make its flower, and then when the flower sets seed, it's not wasting any more time, any more energy into those leaves. And so the quality of the plant starts to decline for nutrition for that particular butterfly. So in reality, here's your highest quality of nutrient, and this is nah, kind of going downhill. So that's why the caterpillars are at the front end of that flowering stage. Uh, then you have chrysalis and adult. So, and this can vary. So threats, common threats to all species in the state of New Hampshire that we identified in our wildlife action plan uh, include obviously the loss of habitat, which is a big factor for all wildlife, uh, but it is very much so for butterflies that usually results in the loss of their host plant, which would then determine they can't feed as a caterpillar, so <coughs> they can't survive. That's usually the key factor. Uh, fragmentation of the available habitat and their ability to disperse, because they tend to live in a small patches, what we call a metapopulation, but it requires movement between them for genetics, and then also if something were to happen to a patch, say a fire or mowing, then when the plant responds and grows back the next year, there needs to be a butterfly close enough to go back in and lay eggs for it to be occupied again. So if we start fragmenting the landscape up too much, then you're going to lose a species from a given area. Pesticides are definitely an issue. Um, when we're buying plants for our pollinator garden, sometimes they're pre-treated with a systemic insecticide. So you may actually be poisoning uh, the very species you're trying to help um, so definitely read the labels, uh, but also just if you're applying chemicals, you know, being cautious about using it sparingly, but you could again lose the host plant. Climate change, slow, but it can affect survival. Uh, it could misalign the plant and the caterpillar phase, and so there's no food available. It could also just push the environmental temperature and gradients so that 
a particular phase of the butterfly doesn't survive. So if the corner blue butterfly had hatched last week, but then we got snow this weekend, it might not have survived. And so if we're having a lot of variation of the start and stop of spring, then we could start to see effects in the population over time. Disease and parasitoids, there's just shifting of, of insects and diseases uh, all across the landscape from human activity, also as a result of climate change. Uh, invasive plants could come in and take over a host plant and make it disappear from a particular area. Uh, recreation, if people are walking off trail and stepping on a rare plant that is the only food source for a given butterfly, which we have a few, uh, you could actually start to have a, a damage on the population if it happened frequently enough. And then agriculture um, can, re can result in conversion of habitat and row crops if they're not allowed to have some natural colonization of other plants and mowing, timing and intensity. So if people mow three times every year in a grassland at the same time, you're gonna hit certain species in their phases repeatedly and then they may disappear. <coughs> so all of those threats are out there. And I wanted to take a look at how do those threats interact with the varying life stages and the varying life histories of each of these species and what makes a certain species more vulnerable than another one. What eventually leads to a species getting on the T and E or the threatened and endangered species list. And here's a list of high and, and low risk factors and I'll go through some examples. But it's the, the size of the population, the temperature and environmental threshold, how wide that is and what they're capable of withstanding. That would also include their host plant. What their dispersal capability is. So we know that some species migrate, like the monarch, so they really aren't as limited by dispersal as say the corner blue butterfly, which typically only moves about 300 meters for the most part. It can move up to two kilometers, but it's pretty rare, and it's a good wind is usually helping it along. Um, some of the other things is also the, the rarity and the specialization of the habitat. So not only if it has just one single host plant, and that host plant itself is pretty rare, but then the environment or the particular habitat type, in the case of the carner, which is the pine barrens, if that's rare too, then you have no place for the rare plant than for the rare butterfly. So we'll take a look at some of these. This information came from a study that was done in Europe, uh, probably about the late um, well, it was around 2010, I would say, uh, maybe a little bit earlier. And they looked at the suite of butterflies across multiple countries, and they were evaluating the effects mostly of climate change, but of these cumulative type factors and what they projected would happen over time. So they're very good examples of different life history characteristics. So. This species, the short-tailed blue, is very similar to the eastern-tailed blue, which is a common species in New Hampshire. And it has a large population size. You can find it almost in every corner of the state. Uh, there's large numbers of them. They have multiple generations throughout the year. Uh, they use a variety of grasses for their food. So they have multiple host plants in a, many different habitats. And I don't know much about their environmental tolerance, but my guess is it's pretty wide because they fly through so many months. So we're just gonna assume that's true. So in this particular case, so we have a common species with large population sizes that has multiple food sources and a wide tolerance for variation in environment. Here's the range to start. 
And then about 40 years later, they're showing a shift in the range. So orange is stable, and that's where it's living right now. The dark area is gained. So that means the butterfly starts moving north between climate change and if it's got decent dispersal, because that's calculated in here. I forgot to mention that. And it has availability of its host plant because it's broad and everything. It's gaining the dark, but it's losing this light gray here, which is rather minimal. So overall, it's actually getting a range expansion in the face of climate change and, and so forth. If you project out a little further and the climate continues to change, it's still capable of expanding. So it's evolving. It's, it's capable of solving the problem on its own because it can disperse and it has so much um, tolerance in its life history. So now we'll look at sort of a middle of the road butterfly. This would be the equivalent, I'd think, of our azures. So our spring azure, our summer azure, they, there's pretty large populations. They are common in different parts of the state, maybe not quite so widespread. And they have one to two generations. Our azure's mostly one that I observe. Uh, definitely the spring is one. And um, this particular case, there's a single host plant that's somewhat limited, and they're a little bit less tolerant. So not the most extreme case, but starting to um, narrow its ability to evolve. So again, you look at the change over time with the ability to disperse. It has maybe a little bit less dispersal distance. Here's the stable state now. Moving out 40 years, there's not a lot of range expansion. It's just remaining stable. But maybe because it's plant, it has just one plant that relies on a specific soil. It, it just doesn't have the ability to spread everywhere. So it's still limited to the footprint. And we're losing in the southern part of the range with climate change. You go out further, and now you're starting to see a little bit of gain. My guess would be that the environment got so dry, maybe the conditions started to allow sandier soils. So you gained a little, but you lost an awful lot. So overall, this species is declining just a little bit. Here is an example of a rare species. This is one that has a very limited range. It probably occurs in a few places. It's an Arctic blue. So Arctic to me means uh, higher latitude or an elevation. Could be a mountain type of butterfly. So the small geographic range, because it's limited by some uh, environmental tolerance, it's very narrow. It has two host plants, but they're both rare and they have very limited distribution. So this is one that just doesn't have a lot of room for change. Sorry? That picture doesn't look very good. So you can see it's in its stable state in the northern part, that's Norway. There are some mountain ranges up there. And as it progresses through climate change and maybe some, again, fragmentation projected, and its dispersal is so much, somewhat limited, it's declining, and then it's almost completely extirpated. So I just wanted to walk through that so that people could understand a little bit about how the threats and the life history characteristics merge. So I'm going to give it over to Becca to tell you about the Carner Blue Butterfly. Okay, so my work is, has been on the corner um, recovery project. So this is my fifth season working with the butterfly, trying to restore it here in New Hampshire. So this here shows you the historic and potential recovery areas of the corner. Um, so as you can see, we kind of have our isolated little pocket here in New Hampshire. 
Um, but this yellow here shows the historic range that the Carner Blue used to be found in. So as you can see, it's kind of due to climate change, habitat loss, fragmentation of habitat. We're left with these little isolated pockets as you move across the landscape and head more towards, um, so for New Hampshire here, we have, ours is a pine barrens. It's pitch pine, scrub oak, dry sandy soils. And as you move out west, the habitat switches to an oak savanna. It's a little more moisture. They have more oak. They have less pitch, more grasses, that sort of habitat. And so you can see it's, uh, it's left with these isolated patches. Here in our next closest one here is in New York. It's the Albany pine bush. And that little spot is the only um, here spot they're found here in New Hampshire. Um, so the habitat they're in is called uh, pine barrens. It's dominated by pitch pine, as I said, scrub oak, sandy soils, and it's where their host plant grows. So it is very dependent on disturbance. Um, it's the habitat's used to it. Um, Native Americans used to burn, forage, clear land. So it needs that sort of disturbance to remain natural in its natural state in the environment it wants to. Um, so what we do in order to maintain the habitat, keep it open so that lupin grows, carners can come in and stay there, um, we do fire prescribed burning. And what that does is it allows us to keep areas that are open, open. It flushes the soil with nutrients. So part of the thing, one of the things that makes a pine barren, so pine barrens is the dry sandy soil. So as you guys know, sand doesn't really hold any nutrients. It doesn't hold water. Everything kind of runs through it. So the fire lets us flush nutrients to get plants to propagate and grow in there. And then we do some clear cutting and mowing. And the clear cutting lets us open the canopy. So if we didn't do any management at all, it would turn into basically a woodland shrubland. It would choke out the lupin. The carners would disappear. Other grassland bird species would disappear. Other moth species would disappear. So us doing the management is really critical to maintaining the habitat because it is so used to disturbance. So New Hampshire's carner population is continuing to rise. Um, so a little background about the carners is they were actually extirpated from New Hampshire, which means no known specimens were found. Um, and so the project turned over to Fish and Game in 2000, and we started our captive rearing program, started doing habitat management on the Pine Barrens, and we started doing the captive rearing and releasing from the lab out into the wild. And so this graph shows you that our habitat management and releasing out into the wild has benefited the species and helped them regain their populations out in the wild. So back in 2006, you can see it spiked up to 3,000. And you can kind of see this is a good um, graph to show that insects have kind of fluctuating curved um, population spikes. So you can see sometimes they fall down, some next season they'll go back up, next season they'll fall down. It's kind of how insects are. And I'll just point this out here. This line down the middle here, this black line shows the population trends. You can see it is in steadily increasing here in New Hampshire. So for the corners here, we have a federal recovery goal that we are trying to meet in order for us to be considered recovered here in New Hampshire. So we have to have our first or second brood because the carner does have two flights per year. Um, so we have to have a population size of 3,000 for four out of five years continuously with only one year following below 1,500. So we hit 3,000 in 2016. We dropped just above hovering around 1,500 last year. So for the next three years, we have to have our populations above 3,000 in order, in order to be considered recovered. Um, and so we need to have a certain number of subpopulations as well. Um, so we have to keep the habitat open. This is part of what we do. So we can look at the 
outlay like the layout of the habitat and choose where we need to do our habitat management like what areas are getting overgrown what areas need to be cleared where we need to seed where we need to burn and then we also do plant propagation so we grow plants in the greenhouse not only to feed the larva with but to plant outside for the wild population as well so this helps us determine where we need to increase our lupin populations to help the coroners So it's not just us here at Fish and Game that is working on this project. Here at Fish and Game, we partner with a lot of projects, um, both federal agencies, state agencies, nonprofit organizations, um, sometimes school groups, um, private companies, um, trying to get just as much you know, help and benefit to both the species and um, the department and the state. And so that's my little section on the corners. So I'll give it back over to Heidi here to discuss the frosted elf and butterfly. All right. So the corner blue butterfly was the first really intensive project that New Hampshire Fish and Game and the partners in New Hampshire, all the state agencies, federal agencies, worked together to begin recovery. It was something that allowed us to learn more about butterflies and, and the recovery of that taxa. It's a book that's being written across the country. Just restoration and recovery is a very adaptive learning process. Um, it was federally listed, and so that prompted all of the agencies and the city of Concord to, to move and take action. One of the things that we're trying to do, again, as the non-game and endangered species program, is to preempt federal listing. So, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of our state listed butterflies and then also species of greatest conservation need which are in our wildlife action plan. They are not listed species but they're ones that we're watching for declines. The idea is that we're beginning to catch things before it goes too far and we're taking action to turn them over before that federal listing and eventually we're going to be able to get them to just remain stable as much as possible, keeping those common species common. That's our goal as professionals. That's where we're heading. So the frosted elfin butterfly is a state endangered species that also lives in the Pine Barrens. And it is um, currently being reviewed for federal listing status. It was petitioned by a group. And so we're working with agencies across the state and the service to compile all the information to determine what to do for the species. So this particular species actually is a subspecies and this is a map depicting the entire range across the country. So there's three different subspecies. You can see that the frosted elfin, which is the Califries iris iris, is in the northern portion of the range. Um, this purple is also that, but we'll talk a, min a minute about why the color distinctions. Um, this particular species lives only in South Carolina, so it's considered different than what lives up here. And then there's a group that, another subspecies that is out in Texas. So they're trying to also evaluate if the subspecies status is enough of a separation now to also um, discuss them individually. Here in the northern portion of the range where the frosted elfin lives, there's actually two host plants. Not only does it eat wild lupin, but it also eats wild indigo. It's a baptisia species. And we have this one historical record out on the seacoast in New Hampshire that I'm assuming had to have been a baptisia feeding uh, frosted elfin, but I have no record of them now. It would be fascinating if anyone happened to find them. So all we know right now is that we have the lupin feeding specialist here in Concord in the same place that the corner blue butterfly lives. So here's a nice photo. Uh, the frosted elfin is unique out of the brown elfins in that it has this light 
coloration, and the black dot is the signature. Of, even if the frosting wears off, the black dot is always there. So its life stage is it overwinters as a chrysalis, and it only has one generation per year. So the adult butterfly will start flying soon. It'll lay eggs on the lupin that's slowly developing, and the larva will be hatching and growing in May into June and then turning into a chrysalis sometime in July. So they really get to benefit from the high nutritional content of lupin in that early growth phase. So they're feeding on flowers of the lupin. They're getting that rich, rich uh, nutrition. By the time that larva hits the chrysalis stage, it's almost July, the lupin has gone through its flower, it's formed its seed, and it's heading on the downward phase. And so that species has evolved to stop then. That's its dormancy, and that's why it overwinters as a chrysalis. So there is a picture of an egg nestled in a flower bud. It's very small. Um, we are currently uh, starting up some research in our captive rearing lab. Since we've been very successful with the Carner, we want to take those skills and develop new knowledge to share with the rest of the country as this species status assessment is happening. And so we're going to look at um, the requirement of eating flour versus eating leaves and if that affects how many eggs that the females lay. So we'll do some research on their tolerances and learning uh, what their reproductive capability is. And so then we can project uh, scenarios where things may change in the future. Um, we're also going to take the opportunity to write the book on how to breed it and to rear it in captivity in the face of some unforeseen circumstance, it disappears in the future. We want to know that we have the capability of maintaining it if, for some duration if needed. So that's the research we're starting here. Um, also, you'll see I, I put in something about duff and litter. So here is a typical section of the Pine Barrens where you might have an opening and there's lupin and then there's also some shrub and blueberry. And all of those deciduous plants, they leave leaf litter. And it um, forms what we call the duff layer over time. And often we're trying to burn that off so that the lupin can seed in the sandy soil. But it's a, a variation across the landscape over time. And because the frosted elfin overwinters as a pupa, as that chrysalis phase, it needs the duff to survive the fire. So we need to make sure that we're not removing the duff and litter from our management and accidentally influencing that population on the side. So far, the population seems to be doing great. It's been stable for the past 14 years since I've been here, and we'll continue to monitor it um, in the future. So now we'll go up to the high peaks of New Hampshire to the Presidential Range. The White Mountain Fritillary lives at 4,500 feet of elevation and higher. It does not live below that. It is endemic to New Hampshire. It is the only place in the world that this particular butterfly lives. There are similar species on mountain peaks in Colorado, in Oregon, in Canada, but they're not connected in any way, and they haven't been for a very long time if they were. So the White Mountain Fritillary is a gem that we hope to maintain and protect with all of the partners up there. Uh, last year, we began some work with the um, Appalachian Mountain Club, and we'll be doing some more up there this year. This particular butterfly is like our example, the Arctic Blue. It has one brood per year, and it overwinters as a caterpillar. 
it actually takes two years for that caterpillar to eat enough food to get through to the chrysalis stage to then emerge as adults. So there's actually, there's butterflies every year, but they're alternating. So the eggs that were laid last year will continue to be larvae this year, and they'll be adults in 2019. So the adults in 2018 were eggs in 2016, and so it alternates. Um, we aren't exactly sure what this butterfly needs. We don't know what its host plan is. We don't know if it has multiple host plants. We have an idea. Some of the work that's been done is that it seems to be associated with what we call a snowbank community, which is these areas that the snowdrifts pile up in the rock formations up there, or they're on a certain side of the mountain. And so the snow maintains throughout the season and late into the summer, and it creates a wetter soil, and it creates a different variety of plants. And you can see this particular area. If you've been on top of Mount Washington, usually it's very low, and it's like a blueberry or a lichen bed. But then you get these pockets of just lush vegetation, and that's the snowbank community. So being that it's living up in this high elevation, a very restricted range, it has no connectivity or ability to disperse outside of New Hampshire to other mountain ranges, it's very susceptible to climate change. Uh, if this snowbank community that it depends upon, we think, then starts to change because there's less snowfall or the snowpack doesn't stay as long, it may start to dry up. And the plant that they eat as a larva, which we assume is in there, might disappear. And so that makes it really in threat. But there's a possibility that it just happens to nectar in that area and fly in that area and is detected there, but its host plant is actually something more common that's spread around. And so our work this year, we're going to go back up there and we'll be performing our research in the Mount Washington Observatory. We'll be bringing in females and various host plants that we suspect that they use and test to see if they lay eggs. So ho females typically will only lay eggs if their host plant is present. So we're going to test all of these potential species. And then any eggs that hatch will perform some feeding studies. Because it's possible they use all of this, the plants, but they may perform better on one plant than another. So it still may be critical that all three plants are there because they may produce more eggs from one versus another. So we really are uncertain about how much the climate change is a, f is a factor or will threaten them to extinction. Recreation, this is another example of walking off trail could potentially be very bad and because you could step on their host plant. Another endemic butterfly that we have in the White Mountains is the White Mountain Arctic. And currently, we're not doing any work, but I wanted to include it. There was a PhD student who was up there for about three or four years, uh, between 2011 and 2014. And she collected individuals and did a thorough DNA assessment and looked at a lot of behavioral activity and occupation of the various meadows. So the White Mountain Arctic has the same situation that it's every other year that it emerges. Um, she did find that some butterflies do make it in one year because the genetics were fluid between the two populations. She was looking to see if one population was isolated from the other. So you could have one population be really low in every even year and then the population be really big in the odd year and you could lose one of those every other year. So she showed that there were both pretty stable and some caterpillars were able to make it through and, and bleed through, as they would say, with the DNA. Um, 
Bigelow sedge is its primary host plant, so it's a little bit more distributed across the landscape, and it's not potentially uh, as restricted in where it will grow. And so that's why we have it listed as threatened versus endangered here in New Hampshire, um, because we think the risk is a little bit less than the fritillary. But climate change is still a major factor uh, if things were to vary greatly up on the top of those peaks. So now we'll get into some of the species of greatest conservation need. So these are species that we have not put on our threatened and endangered list. They're species maybe we don't know very much about or they're just starting to see declines and we want to take action prior to the threat becoming so severe. So Hessel's hair streak is a unique example of a species that we thought didn't exist in New Hampshire anymore. And until we started funding the non-game and endangered species program and we had a biologist go out, she was able to find it uh, in a cedar swamp in Kingston. I believe it was Pam Hunt from Audubon. And so, so far, I haven't heard of anyone else going back to look and see how it goes, but uh, hopefully we'll pick up on that in the future. But that was unique. So we put it on our species list of, let's watch that and see what happens. <coughs> the monarch. The monarch is the one that surprised us all, I think. This is that keeping common species common story. We, we just assume the monarch lives everywhere. Uh, it has four to five generations per year. It does have a migration, which is somewhat complex, but it has the ability to move out of those environmental tolerances that may, it may not like, which other species don't. And it can feed on a variety of milkweeds. It's not restricted to anyone, and milkweeds tend to be everywhere. Um, So here's an image of the monarch migration in detail. So again, they have four to five generations, typically four. And the bulk of the population overwinters as an adult here in Mexico. They overwinter in mountains at a certain elevation. I believe it's between eight to 11,000 feet in these particular pine forests. They're looking for a temperature and a humidity that really appeals to them. And so a large portion of them don't survive, and that's a long time for an adult butterfly to exist. Uh, carners last two weeks max. So multiple months is, is amazing. And then as the spring approaches, they start moving north, and they lay eggs, and they develop as caterpillars, and then they bounce again. So then they get here in the summer. They may have another generation just lingering around. And then this one just suddenly makes a beeline for it. They just go. It's crazy. So something is triggered. Again, maybe the phenology of the plant. I can't quite explain it. Um, there are some overwintering populations on the west coast that are completely isolated. Um, with one, a few migrants they've tracked here and there. And then some that have shown up in Florida from time to time. 90% declines in the nation. Huge. In the past two decades, 90%. And this shocked me. I mean, I kept hearing everyone saying, I don't see as many anymore. I don't see as many. And we all took note of it, but it was so common and it's everywhere. No one sees large numbers of them necessarily. So it was hard to detect. But 90% in the past two decades. So primary threats, um, a big portion of the breeding population is in the Midwest, going through that I-35 corridor where the prairie always was. Um, we've had agriculture there for decades and decades, and they still maintained a good population. But they're definitely seeing the declines because of the heavy spraying of fields. So when the Roundup Ready crops were made available, they started spraying in between the rows. 
and around the hedgerows. And so some of those pioneer plants that just took root started disappearing and it had a major impact. So um, loss of habitat. Also the pre-treated systemic plants, like we said in the nurseries, the exposure to um, insecticides also just spraying for insects. It's just, it's a compounding event. We saw how all these things add up. And then disease. Um, definitely there's ways to rear them, to observe. It's been going on in classrooms for a long time. Um, it has to be done properly if you do it and you do lots of them and you're not holding them in great conditions. You could help um, manifest um, a particular disease. Uh, they, they call it OE, and I can't pronounce it myself, but um, you could actually be spreading this if you're not cautious. And so we would just warn people to make sure you read the instructions. Um, there's a lot of good research and groups that are tracking the monarchs. And I did bring a sheet here from the Monarch Joint Venture, which is the clearinghouse for the nation about recommendations. Um, for people who are interested to look at. Um, but what we're doing here in New Hampshire, so I would like to see a baseline of information. I know some people have been collecting data for 30 years, but it's not everywhere and it's, it's um, we could do more. And so I am asking people to participate in these national citizen science efforts. There's Journey North and there's Monarch Watch, which is that tagging program people might have heard of. Um, there, there is the rearing that can be done and you can actually hatch out and look for the disease and report that back in. So you could do a single or, or two butterflies yourself and report that. I think it's the University of Georgia. So we're asking people to help us collect information because at a national level, it's actually missing. And they're, they're a little uncertain about how much we really do contribute to the population overall. Is it 20%? Is it in some years 40%? You know, we know that insect populations fluctuate given environmental temperatures. There's always been the possibility there was a drought in the Midwest and the Northeast kept the species going. So data is great. We are doing some management uh, ourselves. We're doing it on our wildlife management areas. And also, we're trying to uh, ask people to do pollinator work at their homes, gardens, uh, mowing, alternating the timing of mowing. You know, this particular grassland has a lot of forbs and milkweed in it. And that's because it wasn't mowed every year. Maybe it was mowed every other year. So if you have the opportunity to do that, and then outreach. You know, we just want to get the story out there. I don't think anyone knows exactly what's going on. I think it's still surprising. And it's actually uh, a listing decision will be made in June of 2019 on the species. So we want people to know that that's happening as well. And that's a federal listing. But to end on a slightly better note about monarchs, I got this map off the Journey North website today. This is one of the citizen science programs for, for monitoring. And the different colored dots show windows of time and they're tracking the migration coming out of Mexico, coming back here to New Hampshire. So as of today, April 11th, they're just below Virginia. So they're making their way. And from what I hear, usually it's May. I, I'm not always queuing in on them until the fall, but they can show up here in the spring again and do that one or two generations. And Journey North is actually able to track that migration and the phenology. So a lot of people have been noticing monarchs sticking around until October, which was kind of late than previously. So when people are submitting their records all across the country, we're starting to get an image about how the species is shifting, evolving, and then we can start to determine the threat of that from those observations. So keep your eyes peeled. So overall, we've got all kinds of species in New Hampshire. We've got 130 of them, like we said. And Everyone can participate. Everyone can help out. 
So plant some native plants, plant some nectar, plant some host plants. You can plant anything because probably one of those 130 species uses it. So um, just be careful, try to buy plants that aren't treated if you can. We're trying to work with everyone to get, get the stock of untreated plants to be more available. Um, they do say you can cover the plants for a year. Some, sometimes you know, the chemical will dissipate over time. So if you don't have the opportunity, but grow them yourself, seed them. Um, sometimes people don't think to leave some of the leaf litter in their gardens over the winter. And remember the frosted elfin pupates under the leaf material. And if you're removing that, you could be removing the species. You could be removing the blanket that keeps them warm or keeps them moist if they're overwintering uh, in that area. So if you can leave it there and then kind of remove it a little bit later in the season. Um, and participate and tell us what you're seeing. Report into all of the Journey North and the Monarch Watch. And I also have a sign-up sheet here. I'd like to um, start a group in the state of New Hampshire for people who are interested in monitoring butterflies um, to get together and to start compiling all of our data. And there's a lot of informal things that can happen in that group. I think we would join as a chapter to a national effort. And there's also some very rigorous monitoring that you can participate in that would feed back into um, more extensive scientific models. Um, so definitely, please participate. And the last thing, of course, um, you can always donate to the Non-Game and Endangered Species Program. Uh, we are federally funded through an annual allocation from the state wildlife grants. Uh, but we're required to match that with non-federal dollars. And so to come up with that money, the majority of it actually is from a portion of the license plate sales that we receive. We're one of seven agencies. So every dollar that comes in on that also makes it an opportunity for me to apply for another grant to do more work in New Hampshire. So we have the opportunity to compete with other places across the country for more money than just that allocation. And so the license plate is a great source. We also do an annual fund campaign and you can donate, you know, $20, whatever, um, just mail it in. You'll get our Wild Lines newsletter and start to be part of the conversation more. But another way you can help out. Yeah. Which one of the blue flowers, blue flowers, blue uh, butterflies is New Hampshire's the Carner Blue Butterfly. That was way back at the beginning. Okay. That's right, yep. So the school children of Concord uh, brought that to the Capitol. And I don't remember exactly when, but uh, from 2000 to 2015, we worked with the National Wildlife Federation, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and other partners to go into the schools and do the Kids for Carner program. And we were able to work with, uh, I think, there are over 3,000 students in 15 years to teach them about butterfly life cycles, endangered species. They would grow lupin in their classroom and they came out and planted it in the Concord Pine Barrens. And so some of those students now have gone through college and they show up and they tell us how they remember everything about it and walking around and they brought their parents there. and. It was really a fantastic program, and, and we're somewhat inspired to maybe model that with milkweeds and monarchs, so stay tuned. Uh, <laughs> so that's all I have. I'm, Becca and I can take some questions if you want. Yeah, right. Yeah. Oh, yep. Meadowsweet. So that's like a spirea species. There's meadowsweet and there's um, steeple bush. Yep, so there's spirea alba, spirea latifolia. They tend to grow a lot in power lines. So if you're into collecting your own seed and growing plants, it's a great place to go in the fall. Um, they're supposedly really easy to germinate and grow, but uh, they're not my 
I don't, I'm not great at it. I'm trying this year. Yeah, this, <laughs> this is spreading dogbane, which often you see on the side of the road. It likes mowing and disturbance. And it's um, similar to a milkweed species, and it, it has a feathery seed that you just layer with a little bit of dirt and moisture, and, and supposedly that grows really easy too. <laughs> yeah. Two questions. One, when you do the burn on the, on the Concord Heights, does that destroy any overwintering Carter blues? Absolutely, it probably does. And so what we do in that case is we actually have a permit from Fish and Wildlife Service for those activities. And basically we organize the management in blocks that are small so that if there is some loss, there's going to be new butterflies that fly in. And so if we don't do the management, the lupin will disappear. But if we do the management in small increments, it's a net benefit to the species overall. And second question, I was up in, um, by the hut up uh, just north of Lincoln on the trail, and there was a big dog that went by and deposited this huge pile of feces. And a couple of days later, I came back and it was covered. I mean, just wing to wing covered with butterflies. What is their interest? <laughs> so you'll see them collect nutrients. They're they're finding some type of nutrient from it. I've seen them on mud puddles. I've seen them in like at gas stations. Like sometimes you'll see them licking like gasoline piles. They're getting some type of mineral nutrient from feces, mud, dirty water you wouldn't touch. <laughs> um, so yeah, they'll pick up nutrients, minerals that they can find and are looking for. So you can actually see variation in species of how much of that behavior there is depending on what type of plant they eat. So if they're eating a nutrient poor plant, they may be more likely to forage for extra nutrients in the adult phase to successfully reproduce. Okay. So, yeah. What is the butterflies being protected over at the National Guard Armory? That's the Carner Blue butterfly. Yeah, Carner. Yep. But also the frosted elfin and the Perseus dusky wing skipper which there are almost 60 species right on that 300 acres at the Concord Airport of butterflies that we've documented and over 500 species of moths. We didn't even talk about moths today. <laughs> so. Any other questions? Yes. So if they're bound to like something like that so much, It's quite possible. Um, we don't have a lot of documentation about just random non-point source pollution or anything. I think the only th thing we can tie it to right now is if you have plants that are treated. But uh, it could happen, absolutely. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you, everyone. And um, again, Becca brought in a few things to look at through the microscope. So if you want to take a look, and we'll be around if you just want to talk some more. Thank you. Yep.